What's up, crew? Welcome to Filming in Progress, the show that takes you backstage into the world of local businesses and the people who make them shine. Today, we have Russ Prefontaine with us. He's the co-founder of Fratello Coffee Roasters. Russ brings a lifetime of coffee expertise and entrepreneurial experience to Calgary's coffee scene. And with his family-rooted dedication to quality and innovation, Russ has shaped Fratello into a celebrated brand for coffee lovers everywhere. Russ, thanks so much for being here. My pleasure. We're at Fratello Coffee Roasters. This has uh, been where we've been roasting coffee in Calgary since 1999 now in this facility. Since 1999. Yeah, yeah. Tell me about how you first got involved with coffee. Well, we grew up in it, so I was pretty fortunate that way that I didn't have to try to think of this business. It was uh, ingrained in us from, well, literally from birth. My parents started in the coffee business in 1974 in Vancouver. At that time, they were doing um, like an office coffee service. But the product was pretty, pretty low quality. It was all powder-based, powder-based juices and coffees and soups and things like that. This was mid-70s. Uh, but they moved to Calgary in 1975 and opened up his own division doing the same thing. Uh, this was out of our garage and basement as a kid. So uh, to get allowance, we'd be right, helping my dad do inventory or cleaning equipment and things like that. Uh, but he was never happy with the quality. So he approached a local coffee roaster in Calgary in 1985, and they actually traded businesses. So my dad wanted to start doing his own roasting and take control of quality in his own hands. And uh, right, that's how we got into coffee, really, was when he was roasting. Um, and from there, it's gone into many different directions, of course. Yeah. So you, you grew up in it uh, by default, uh, alongside your brothers. That's right, two older brothers. It was weird. We never, <laughs> my parents never tried to push it on us. It was never assumed we were going to take it on either. It was just natural that we were like in it. We grew up watching my parents and the lifestyle they had, the freedoms they had running their own business. Uh, they never tried to convince us to be entrepreneurs either. Uh, it was just, it's in us, it's in our blood uh, to be an entrepreneur and run our own businesses. Uh, so yeah, it's been good. It's been good growing up in it. Did you at any point step away to do anything other than uh, the family business, coffee related, anything like that? Not really. Um, even when I was in high school, I was working at cafes as a barista. Um, for my uncle, he had a cafe, some community cafes as well that I was part of. Uh, my brothers started a company called Espacino Imports. This was in 91, and at that time they were importing uh, specialty equipment from Italy, Nuova Simonelli, things like that. And during that time, my brothers were in SATE. So even then, they were running this coffee business outside of my parents, uh, while they were going to university. Uh, and after high school, I went to state for one year, only took one year of business administration there, and uh, all of my projects were based around coffee. Starting a cafe, opening up this, opening up that, it was always coffee related. So even when I was in school, my head was naturally in the family business. Um, school wasn't for me, I joined my brothers in 93 uh, as a technician and did all sorts of different positions with them. Uh, and then the three of us in 1997 purchased my parents out. It was right after my dad survived cancer for a second time. He was done. Yeah, he needed to get out and uh, we wanted to uh, maintain that in, in the family. And uh, the three of us partnered at that time and uh, grew it from there. I always find it interesting, what, you know, you, you stumble across a uh, avenue, but you stay in it because of you're passionate about it. And it mm -hmm. seems like that's the case uh, with you and coffee. Mm -hmm. um, what, what is it about coffee that fascinates you and, and what made you want to build your living in mm -hmm. the business of coffee? Well, it's interesting. We've, um, because we've been in coffee our whole life, but we've had many, many businesses we've started along the way all related to the coffee business. Some of them were uh, a syrup business we had called Valletta Flavors. And it was coffee syrups and chai and smoothies. So completely unrelated to coffee, but still the same customers. And in a way, I think it is the, the customers that keep us coming back. The community, the whole coffee community, even our competitors in the city, I really enjoy their company. I like working with them, dealing with them, uh, there are kind of people. So it's easy to just want to continue being in that business. 
Um, in a way, I think it's more that than the actual passion of coffee. Don't get me wrong, I love it. I love every aspect of coffee. Uh, traveling to origin, seeing the producers, right? I get jazzed up every time I do that. But that's also because of the people, right? The producers, the people, everyone along the chain just has these, these common values, uh, common values of community, common values of family, and uh, right, a family business, my whole life, we just relate to them. So I think that's what really keeps us going is uh, that connection. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, I, I think anybody who's been around the coffee scene or the specialty coffee scene can agree with you in the sense that it is a community. Mm -hmm. Why Why do you think that is, even from, from origin to, you know, the cup being served at a cafe? That is a really great question. Uh, and I've never actually tried to think about that. And I don't even know how to answer that, to be honest. Um, it's very unique, very unique. And anyone I've traveled with, especially when you go to Origin and they're connecting all of the people they've seen at a, a barista and then all the way at our Origin are saying the same thing. It's like, what? Everyone in this industry is so nice. They're so kind. Maybe it's because it's so delicious. <laughs> it's, it's like we're not pumping oil or, or something like that. We're having this delicious beverage, sharing moments and connections. Uh, what is there to be, what is there to be cranky about <laughs> right around this tasty beverage? Yeah. So you've, you've tried, you've, you've done, sorry, many different things in the coffee industry, both yes. yourself and mm -hmm. your family. Um, and now you've kind of narrowed it down to, to the one, the one thing that you're doing now. Mm -hmm. So tell me about that journey, the other, the other avenues that you've looked at and, and experimented with, mm -hmm. and then ultimately why you've decided to stay with, uh, with, um, Fratello. Yeah, it's a long, long tale, uh, just with all the different businesses we've uh, done and started. Um, the most notable uh, locally here would be Analog Coffee was one of our projects that we started. Uh, when we did that, we really wanted to show Calgary what our coffee was all about. Uh, we wanted to create a brand awareness around Fertello Coffee Roasters. And before that, our story was being told through our wholesalers. And we wanted to take control of our own story and show people what we've been talking about all these years with uh, mentoring and consulting and, and trying to show them what we meant. Um, that was a fun project and it was done through Fratello Experiences. So it was because of all the years of experience we've had helping people open up cafes and, and developing their own stories and dreams that we were able to do Analog Coffee so successfully. Same is true when we did Slayer Espresso. For many years, we've been importing, servicing, and fixing espresso machines that we really knew what the insides were, what the problems were, how it could be better. And uh, when we started Slayer, we wanted to create the best machine in the world, not only for um, the output in how much it can produce, but for the feeling that the baristas had when they're using wooden panels, everything they touched was wooden. And we were able to do that through the experiences of Fratello, right? Because of our service background, we we're able to approach a machine in a different way. So when you start looking at all of that, it all boiled down to Fratello, right? It's all of our history. Um, and if we do Fratello well, all of the other experiences we've had help us do Fratello better, right? We can understand the position of our customers. We can understand what they're looking for or hoping for when starting a business. We had to do the same. So it's those experiences throughout the last 50 years that now allow us to do Fratello Coffee as well as we do, right? True consultants and partners uh, who understand all different aspects of that industry and business, uh, it was natural to want to focus on that. Back to our roots and uh, right, focusing on, on just producing great coffee and helping local communities and, and companies do their businesses better. Awesome. Mm -hmm. I love that idea of taking that narrative back into your own hands. You know, when 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 you leave it be, you never, you never know how that, that story is being told or how it ends mm -hmm. up, right? How do you, in your current relationships and uh, you know, business engagements, that sort of thing, how do you uphold that, that idea of you know, maintaining that narrative to, to the quality that you'd like to? Well, that's a lot of work, uh, especially with coffee, because it's, it's a very complicated beverage to do well. 
there's a short lifespan from when you can get it from a roaster until you're brewing in your cafe. There's a very short window. And same with us when we're receiving green beans to roast it. That any change along that will change the cup of coffee. So to get the quality we're looking for out of our wholesale partners is a dedicated team here that's visiting, teaching, educating, doing our own quality assurance checks, um, continual training, because our, our accounts are getting new employees all the time. And so you might spend time training and coaching uh, for consistency at a location, but the next season comes and it's a whole new team. So it's developing tools that they can use uh, to help execute the coffee through their venues in the way that we're hoping. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when I think of when I think of you know a good cafe versus a bad cafe as an example, um, I might think you know consistency is one. When you might you, you yes. get a great cup of coffee one time you go in, but a you know yeah. an average the next time. Absolutely. Um, obviously, you know maintaining that level of quality as you mentioned is is constant education. Yeah. Was that something that you knew was going to be the case when you entered this market? Like no, I wouldn't say so. I, I think that really came to light when we had analog, and until you're you're running these cafes, you don't really realize how much work is required in that training and how many hours. It takes to train someone days, weeks to do the same thing right every day. And you might get it right 70% of the time, but how can you get it right 90% of the time? And we did not want to grow our locations or expand the concept until we could answer that question. How could we ensure consistency and quality when we're not there or when the managers aren't there? And for us, that also included hospitality. So it wasn't just tamping your espresso right and steaming the milk right. It was greeting the customer right and treating them with the respect and hospitality that I would want if I was entering there or that I would give you if you're entering my home, right? That's, that's the level of hospitality we're hoping for when a guest would enter our store at any time at any of the locations. So a lot of documentation, a lot of uh, work on the processes, but also the processes to ensure that those are being done. So it isn't just leaving the tools in the store and hoping that the team is using them. It's then creating tools that were uh, ensuring our management team was using the tools for the barista team and so on and so on. So it's uh, uh, continually checking and double checking to ensure that, that you're getting the, the right information. Right. When, that le when, the, when the level of service is that important to you, I, I would imagine there's, there's accounts that maybe just don't fit the narrative of Fratello, right? They, they just, yeah. it doesn't make sense. W what kind of criteria do you have in place to, to determine those? Yeah, I wouldn't say we have necessarily criteria. It's not like a checklist. Uh, often you'll be communicating with someone, it's just a vibe you get, right? They don't value the same things as you, uh, perhaps, price is the most important thing to this customer um, or, or a, a coffee offering that we just don't do might be what they're looking for, an instant coffee or a flavored coffee, something like that, that, that we're just not about anymore. Uh, and we went through a, a big downsizing. It was around 2006, 2007. And it was right when we were coming out with Slayer Espresso Machines. And we we're about to unveil this machine we've been working on for seven or eight years at the Specialty Coffee Association Expo. <laughs> it was a big unveiling. And we took a look at what we were doing at Fratello. And we'd lost focus. And we kind of looked at some of the products we were doing and the customers we were working with and realized a lot of them actually don't drive with us anymore. And we took a very bold move. And uh, it was in one day, my brothers and I left the boardroom and uh, we had an executive team at that time running all of our divisions and we knew, right, it stops, starts at the top and works its way down. So we had to change and we made the decision that we are gonna change the direction of Fratello to be amongst the best third wave coffee roasters there are. This was right at the beginning, right at the beginning. And we uh, let our executive team go and we contacted a, a large amount of our customers. It worked out to be about 50% of our volume and let them know that this would be the last, last time we could work with them. So we did a drastic downsizing to, to start moving Fratello into the direction where we want it to be, where we were about, and that's quality. 
Um, so we did that, rebranded from Custom Gourmet Coffee at the time to Fertello Coffee Roasters, uh, redid our logo, all the branding, downsized our company, and then launched uh, Slayer Espresso all, all in the same year. It was a big year, and it was risky. Yeah, 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 that's an incredible risk. I mean, you're taking something that's safe and, and, and established mm. to, you know, obviously you believed in it, the quality was important to you, that's why you did it, but something that's a lot more risky. What, I mean, I understand the quality was what kind of drove that decision, but what, uh, how, how, did you, how did you determine that that's the right move? Well, we didn't know at the time if it was the right move, but what we were offering and what Custom Gourmet Coffee was doing wasn't authentic to who we were. Right? This was during a time when the, the single origin coffees that we drink and enjoy today weren't available. People weren't doing direct trade relationships. They weren't doing origin trips. And it changed quickly and drastically. And it was a way for uh, cafes and, and diners and things to start competing with Starbucks. They had to do it better. Either better or what? Well, how would you compete against this new giant chain that just came up among us? And for everyone, it was about quality. And we knew that. And when we tasted some of the coffees being produced from some of these newer roasters, we liked them a lot. That's what we like. That's why we created this machine, Slayer Espresso, is to brew those coffees better. And here we were as a company, not even roasting or offering that quality. So, so we knew that's where the industry was going and wanted and needed these tools. But we were so busy creating it that we didn't take a look at what we were doing ourselves to go, holy cow. <laughs> we let our company shift into direction where it's no longer authentically what we're passionate about. So the change was necessary to be true to who we were. Uh, we had no idea what was gonna happen or if that was the right move. It took many years, many years to convince our customers that it was the right move uh, because they were used to dealing with the old custom gourmet coffee and the new Fratello coffee roasters was different. And a lot of people don't like change. Uh, so that was a, a journey to educate them on why it's important to them and how they could use this to compete against uh, the, the big chains out there. Did they ultimately come around or was there any customers, were there any customers that maybe just decided that that new direction wasn't for them? Lots, lots decided that and that was fine. We, we knew that would be the case. Uh, when we did make the decision, it wasn't this drastic change like this where all of our coffees were different. We slowly introduce a new offering, slowly bring in a new uh, higher quality Colombian, slowly talking about auction lot, uh, cup of excellence coffees. Um, Right? And then also educating ourselves, right? How can we start sourcing coffees like this? Um, I was on the jury for the Cup of Excellence uh, in three different countries, right? To get to know producers and get to understand what qualities are available in different regions before we really started introducing it. So it was a decision we made internally, but the process probably took a good five to eight years to really get most of our customers choosing the higher quality. So we stuck with a lot of the older options and then little introductions of try this, try that, right? And, and still it was a struggle. And when we did analog coffee, that was our, our last, like, come on guys, let's, let's show them how to do this. Let's show them that they can charge more per cup. You can have different prices per cup depending on the quality. You can treat this like wine. Right, start educating people and giving them higher quality and different choices when they're at the bar. And that was really our, our moment where our customers started believing that that direction was the right direction. Awesome. Why, you, you mentioned price in there and that it's justified to you know, charge uh, different amounts per quality. And mm -hmm. it, you, know, you, you, you use an example of wine and I think it's such a commonly understood topic that or um, idea that wine costs more depending on where it's from, depending mm -hmm. on how long it's aged, all these different factors, not in similar to coffee. Why do you think there's such a, maybe barrier is the wrong word, but uh, you know, um, why are we so, why is that so hard for people to understand the same thing about coffee as it is about wine? That is a great question. And it has been one that I think the whole industry has struggled with. 
And when the first third wave movement in cafes came out, they were starting to get this kind of attitude where people were trying to push this information on the consumer on why, why, why. And they were talking to a consumer who just wanted a cup of coffee. So if you're there preaching to someone, they don't want to listen. So what is the right way to start giving them information and educating them? I don't know. I don't know how to answer that. All right. We've got lots of information on our website, as do many others, talking about relationships and, and, and different varietals and growing, growing regions and processing methods and, and different uh, drying methods that can enhance flavors. But it's slow for them to pick it up. And right, is it because they were brought up in, in, the, in, in an age where they're drinking coffee out of a tin and they just don't get it? They just, they don't understand it? I, I don't know what the answer is for that. I wish I knew. Uh, the industry would thank me. <laughs> no doubt. When you were saying that, just uh, the thought that popped into my head, you, you know, you may, maybe uh, ca- the people that are just looking for coffee as a, as a, as a means of caffeine injection, you know, yes. it's similar to maybe liquor. It might, maybe they're buying lucky beers instead of Correct. fine exactly. wines, right? So yeah. it's that education piece, yeah. as you mentioned. Yeah. So you need to be telling it to the right consumer first. Uh, and I think those consumers do understand it, right? It's, it's gone a long way, a long way. And uh, those consumers are, are buying coffee on subscription services through different roasters and, and buying direct and uh, purchasing coffees for their specific tasting notes. It's come a long way, a long way. But still, if you look at the whole coffee industry, that's a very, very narrow niche of customer looking for those sort of products. So the vast majority of the consumers out there are still looking for that cup of coffee. Uh, I think what they're looking for is a better cup of coffee, and they might not understand why it's better, but they're starting to recognize that there are differences in flavors and options out there. Uh, Teaching them why it's better, I I think we still got some work to do there. So you do think that that we're progressing in the right direction and people are starting to ask why? I do. Yeah, I I do. Uh, It's a lot of the younger generation as well who who really want to know where their products are coming from. Uh, coffee, wine, food, right? The whole local movement, especially during COVID, that really pushed the localization of, of buying products that are made locally, supporting smaller businesses. Uh, that was a big push and that, that was great for, I think everybody in uh, who's a local entrepreneur benefited from that realization of how important it is. Still all the big box stores are, are dominant, but right, choosing local and supporting local goes so far in the community um, and it, with your local cafes, especially right with our industry, it's, it's, uh, it's driving everything we do. Mm-hmm. You've mentioned the term third wave. Yes. Can you clarify what that means? I think everyone you ask is going to give a different opinion. Uh, there isn't a, a, a true term which defines it. Um, it started, I don't even know the year it started. It was in the early 2000s, I want to say. And it was after Starbucks. Starbucks, that was really the second wave of, of commercializing espresso-based beverages, making that common. And the third wave movement, is if, right, are you talking to a, a coffee producer? Are you talking to a cafe? Are you talking to a roaster? We're all going to have a different opinion to what that is. I heard one definition the other day, and it was the, the realization of that everything matters, of how important all of the details are, and really recognizing that there are all these people in the chain, and it's choosing to do things better, focusing on quality, focusing on producer, focusing on relationship. In the cafes, right, the right equipment, the right hospitality, the right lighting, the right music. It's, it's choosing to really value everything that matters. But depending on the industry, that whatever matters is going to be different, right? If you're visiting a cafe yourself, what are you looking for, right? The comfort, right? The, the people behind the bar, uh, understanding that they're, they're tamping and brewing your coffee right. As a coffee roaster, it might be roasting in small batches, accentuating sweetness or acidities. Uh, ensuring the roast dates are proper, uh, ensuring there is a traceability to the producer. For producer, what are they valuing, right? I can go on and on and on, 
but it is like an awakening of choosing the right decisions all where you can to ensure that you're uh, accentuating quality and giving the best service possible. Is that a definition of third wave? No, it isn't, but I don't know how to explain it uh, any other way. No, that's great. Yeah. So maybe, yeah, okay. So de designing the experience and the traceability and then making yeah. right decisions and okay. Yeah, yeah awesome. all by design, all choosing those right decisions. Right. Yeah. You mentioned um, that y when you decided to change from from Custom Gourmet to Fratello, this was kind of at the for at the beginning of uh, when when coffee roasters and and that sort of thing, cafes, et cetera, started to value you know going direct to source. Um, so I imagine there'd be a lot of complexities with trying to do so, uh, going meet going to meet the farmers and and that sort of thing. Is that the case? There it is for us, right? And again, how do you define direct trade? There isn't necessarily a, a rule or a definition, and everyone does it differently. Um, for us, it's about a long-term decision. So when we were choosing, and when we are today, choosing to call someone a direct trade partner, it's a long-term decision. So we chose them for a reason. We've been using them for years. It's been consistent. We're, we're getting along. We're communicating. Uh, the product is as they say. It, it is as we chose, right? So now let's start investing into this relationship. Now let's get down to origin and really get to know each other, see your operations, how are you treating your, your, your community, your em employees, uh, the actual coffee uh, harvesting. Uh, are these people we want to work with? Would we be proud to say we're working with this person? Uh, and then when we do decide, mutual, right? It's mutual, they could tell us that they're not interested as well. It's a mutual decision. And then it's, it's for a while. Right. These relationships have gone on for 15, 18 years now, and it's wonderful, right? It's wonderful to have that level of consistency and trust. Um, and we always throw in some new ones to, to keep things fresh and, and exciting, but it's those long-term relationships that mean a lot. Yeah, I, I imagine with those long-term relationships comes the consistency, consistency that you're talking to, but potentially also I'm looking at it the flip side, you know, where it's a bad year for the producer, yep. you know, and maybe they their their quality isn't quite as high or they didn't get as much rain or all the complexities that go into their end. It's you so know? true, yeah. Um, and there's probably a level of understanding that exists. It needs to be. It needs to be because it is changing year to year, right, depending on the amount of sun or rain, soil conditions. Uh, if fertilizer costs are through the roof, which happens all the time, and they might not be able to fertilize as often, as an example, is going to affect the taste of the coffee. So there are changes year to year. And uh, luckily, because we have these long relationships, they usually allow us to get the quality we're looking for first. So we do have that uh, luxury, I'll say. Uh, but it isn't 100% the same every year. And there are years where we're disappointed uh, as are they. There are years where you have to just work together and get through it. And that'll then change the way we have to roast that coffee or potentially how we even use that green coffee. Maybe it's used in a blend more uh, or in a dark roast more because you're not going to notice the nuances of those green beans as much as if it was a light roast single origin offering. So we do have ways that we can work with them and, and ensure that we, we still use all the coffee that we've committed to. You talked a little bit about regulation in there and how there's maybe not, uh, maybe correct me if I'm wrong, but a, a body that regulates kind of what these terms mean, how to go about these things. Do you think that's a Do you think that's a good thing, or do you think that maybe somebody should enter the space to to regulate that, or what, yeah, what do you think? It's a double-edged sword, right? Part of what I don't like uh, with a fair trade model, just use that as an example is it's a governing body, it's an organization. There's a lot of costs involved to run that organization. So the premiums you're paying, a part of it is going to the producers because a large part of it is going to the organization to make sure that they're monitoring and in, right, all their processes at Coffee Origin are correct, right? Auditing us, making sure our processes are correct. And I get it, you need to do that but the premiums we are paying aren't going the direction we want it to go. So that's why a lot of uh, coffee roasters go direct, is 
the extra funds are going to the producers and that's where we want it to go to, to help them out. But if there's no governing body, then people can say whatever they want. There's a lot of people who say they roast, but they don't. There's a lot of people that say they do direct trade because they've done one tourist trip <laughs> and suddenly they're doing direct trade. So unfortunately, there's a lot of people who are bending those rules a little bit. Um, and it's, it's, it's unfortunate, but the only way around it is to then have that governing body who needs to make uh, their funds through the fees we're hoping goes to the producers. Do you think that, you know, larger organizations, uh, I'm going to use Starbucks, not picking them sure, out, but yeah. that, that throw these kind of labels on their packaging saying that they're doing these things, but then are able to, you know, produce at a dollar a cup kind of situation is, is hurting the industry? Well, I've been to uh, many farms and often you'll go to uh, very high quality farms and you'll see Starbucks signs or you'll see uh, like a Nestle sign. Um, or the Nespresso signs. And these companies, they do a lot of good work as well down there. So they get a bad rep, but they actually do have their own internal auditing processes. So they're not utilizing those third party, again, like a fair trade, they have their own. So, right? I don't know what they're paying. I don't know what they're paying these producers, but I see the work they're doing at the farms and it is good work. They're creating uh, their own auditing systems to help producers do a more consistent job, which is good. Ultimately, that is great. If they can do their work, uh, call it not necessarily easier, but more consistently, can have a team, uh, can have an educational system, uh, show them how to store chemicals in a, in a better way. This is all good stuff. This is all good. So in, in the end, I believe their processes that they're implementing around the world are, are benefiting uh, coffee roasters like ourselves. They're not buying the same quality. They're not. There's not that much quality to go around. Right? They buy too much coffee, right? It, it's impossible. Uh, but the work they're doing down there is, is beneficial. How do you choose what markets you go to? I know, obviously, you know, the relationship and that sort of thing. Once you meet these people, the quality, that sort of thing. But before that, how do you choose what markets you're going to go to to, to you know, choose out a new, a new farm source? I'm probably not using the right terms there. Yeah, for us, it really depends on um, the, the volume that we're buying from a specific region. Um, we buy a lot of smaller micro lots from uh, the importers. And we've got 50 years of relationships with, with importers. So... I have a lot of people that we can talk to who have their own relationships at origin. So often we'll utilize their relationships to start in an origin, let's say Kenya, whatever. And it's uh, in season coffee right now. So I'll work with one of them uh, through one of their projects to find something that is uh, specifically delicious. If it resonates with our customers, we would look to source it again, right? And as we grow that origin with our customers, you'll get to the point where it makes sense for us to start investing into that relationship. But we're always bringing in different coffees. Uh, let's say Tanzania, I'm just making up a name. Maybe it doesn't resonate. So let's put that one off the side and let's try a different origin and see if this is a, a profile that people are enjoying. And then it will just grow from there and it'll take however long it takes to get to the point where we believe it's what our clientele want on a regular basis. And if they want it on a regular basis, then it's worth, worth exploring that relationship. As, as, as the guy that sees uh, this process from beginning to end, you know, from, from green bean at origin to, to roasting in your facility to the experience that you're designing to the end, cons end consumer who that might be in form of a bag of roasted beans in, in a cup of coffee at a cafe, et cetera. What is it that you want to be understood by the end consumer when they purchase a Fratello product? Our profile is typically sweet, is uh, chocolatey, caramelly. Uh, it's uh, enjoyable by the masses. It is trusted and it's consistent and it's reliable. Right? Is that sexy? Well, I don't know. But it's what keeps people coming back. It's what they want most of the time. 
And people have relied on our products for many years. For example, Godfather Espresso. Uh, it's our number one selling coffee. We've had it for decades. And the profile's the same. And I hear all the time how much people love that coffee because it's always the same. <laughs> they can rely on it. Fi like finally a coffee that whenever I brew it, any month, any year, it has been the same profile of deliciousness. And I think that's what we're really well known for is that consistency. It's, it's something that uh, they can rely on, right? It's, it's always keeping them happy versus something new all the time. Mm -hmm. When it comes to uh, the actual roasting process and, and building out that consistency in product, what, what does that look like? You know, a lot of the people listening probably have, don't know much about roasting and mm. the, what it takes to keep that consistency um, from cup to cup, from year to year, decade to decade? Mm -hmm. Well, I have a great team. Um, there are uh, uh, licensed Q graders and have been through several courses and are educated on how to do that. They, they would be someone better to answer that question than myself. But it's a lot of tasting. It's a lot of um, uh, playing around with different temperatures and speeds, uh, trying to develop different natural flavors found in those beans to get to a point where we're we're, we're seeing the flavors or, or what we tasted when we first cupped that coffee on an arrival or at origin. There might be something that really stood out, a lemon note. Okay, once we develop that here through our process, it is how do you maintain that? And what changes is the green beans. What changes is the temperature outside from negative 30 to plus 30 in Calgary. Uh, and in the green beans, as they start to, to age a little bit, they, they require little tweaks in the recipe and the profile to accentuate that. So if you're not tasting it all the time, then you're going to lose that. So it's continual little adjustments in our process during weather changes, during uh, harvest changes, uh, even the batch size that we're doing from 50 pounds to 200 pounds of coffee will will require different approaches to those beans to make sure that they are tasting the same. So it's a continual, continual process. It, it, it's never done. It's never finished. I'm curious why Calgary? Uh, I, I know you mentioned that your dad started in Vancouver um, and maybe there's an element of this is where it began. I'm not sure, but why Calgary and, and kind of what does the Calgary business landscape um, you know, bring to your business? Why Calgary? Uh, my parents came to Calgary because they were offered it as a, a, a place to move a division. So it was, it was offered to them and they brought the family here when, uh, uh, before I was born. And now we're very established. Uh, we're a very established brand here. Uh, I couldn't imagine picking this up and moving it to a different city and why. Right? We've been supported my whole life the city has supported us, has given us the opportunity to do what we do. Uh, if it wasn't for the city, what would we be doing? Like, I, I couldn't even answer that. We've been, we've been in coffee our, our whole life, so what would I do outside of, of, of coffee? What would I do outside of Calgary? Like, this is who we are. We're, this is our town. <laughs> These are our people, right? They, they've given us so much, so much support that I, I couldn't imagine leaving. Just, and yeah, it's a, such an entrepreneurial spirit here. Um, they give so much back to the, the smaller local entrepreneurs and businesses. It's uh, very supportive, uh, unique. Something that always comes to mind when I think about cafes, and I know this isn't your, you know, you don't, you don't do cafes right now, but um, is, is the people. And we talked a lot about people earlier, um, but that it's, it's, uh, it's this... It's an e it's an easy access job for for young folk, you know mm -hmm. that that you know they're starting their their line of work that sort of thing. Um, I guess my question is along the lines of how do you how do you attract the right people? How do you attract the right people and and keep them around? Um, and, and is there a criteria or or a, a method that you use? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We had uh, determined when we were, we first started analog that it was all about the people. And same with here, it's all about the people you surround yourself with. Uh, surround yourself with great people and, and you can accomplish a lot. So in the cafe setting, I was mentioning earlier that it was all about right, hospitality. 
So we were hiring for that, hiring for attitude, hiring for right, the way they would communicate, looking you in the eye, uh, natural smiles, not being forced. Everything else can be taught. That's easy. That's very easy to teach compared to authentic, friendly people. Uh, so it started with that. And then we developed um, uh, some interview criteria to give to our managers to help them kind of narrow down the right kind of candidates. Uh, we would then have uh, one of our trainers or someone else from our team join on a second interview to kind of see if, to, if, if they felt that same sort of vibe. So it was a vetting process uh, to ensure that you always had those right-minded people on the team. Um, you get one wrong egg in there and it could affect everyone else's attitude. So as long as we were constantly talking about that, measuring it, uh, giving them the tools to help them uh, develop those uh, relationships once they are on the team, uh, went a long way. Yeah. Uh, so there wasn't, it's not a quick answer for that. It was ongoing. Have you ever, have, I'm, I'm sure you have, have you had an experience with that wrong egg situation that kind of contaminates everything else and how did you deal with that? Yes, we have. <laughs> <laughs> they were dealt with, uh, uh, I, I like the saying, fail fast. And uh, everyone fails, so that's fine. Totally fine. But the faster you can recognize that and move on, the better it is for everybody. Uh, so if you fail, no problem. Just to make the decision quickly. Uh, right? This isn't the right fit. Uh, for you or for I, right? And, and we're giving you an opportunity to, to move someplace else, right? There's many ways to, to part ways, and uh, I always want to part ways well, because you never know when you're going to cross paths again. You never know what can happen down the road, so there, there's no need to do it in a negative way or a harsh way. Um, but I, li I like to have that decision as quickly as possible, definitely. I love the fail fast ideology, and I think that's so important, especially for business. You know, you've been around for as long as you have in, in the various avenues, and I'm sure that the ability to learn from a mistake is is what's is you know what's contributed to your success. Do you have a, a methodology um, to learn and implement from mistakes? No, I don't really have an answer for that. It's been because uh, every every failure, call it, or every mistake is going to be different, uh, different. Levels of severity, our, our most severe was when we did Corbo Bakehouse. It was uh, on 17th Avenue, and we invested a tremendous amount of time and, and resources to open up that restaurant, uh, cafe, bakery, uh, wholesale operation. And it was busy, and everyone, right, everyone loved it who was trying it. And 11 months later, we closed it. Why? We knew. We knew we didn't know what we were doing. It was, we were in the wrong business. So we could continue trying to force that to happen. And who knows, who knows what would have happened, or just right away determine that this was wrong. This was a failure. We shouldn't have done this. Let's move on. Let's pivot and continue on. So we've had lots of mistakes through the year. Uh, I think every entrepreneur does have failures. So it would be silly to think that you would open up a business and have nothing but success. And when you're outside looking in, I think that's usually just what you see are, are all the successes. Wow, you did, it was so easy. And you don't talk about or, or market and, and, and celebrate the failures. Who, who would? They're terrible. But you learn from them and you try not to repeat them. And that is what has made us to what we are today are all of those failures and the wins. But if you're learning from failures and adjusting what you're doing, adjusting your focus, uh, then it makes you stronger. This, that's the second time throughout this conversation alone. I'm sure there's have been, been many others where um, you've mentioned it was it was a feeling that that drove a significant business decision, mm -hmm. right? Closing Corbo uh, and changing your focus back all those years ago. Um, I guess what is the importance of kind of listening to your gut and staying true to you are to who you are in business uh, rather than potentially following you know like as you mentioned Corbo was was doing great. Right? It's more than your gut, right? I think you you feel it in your gut, and it might be nerves, right? It might be the the feeling of I don't want to go into work today, right? The, that kind of stress that's that weighs you down that 
that one day you make that decision. Well, it was a, a year that led up to that. And we've had consultants, right? We bring on a trusted team of advisors and we talk to people. And so it isn't a quick decision. It, it's, it's thought about in great detail before we make those decisions. Um, if you close a business after 11 months, you'd probably assume that was a quick decision, but we were talking about it almost the whole time. It was an, it was an uncomfortable business to be in the whole time. That's telling you something. If you're not enjoying it from the get-go, then you're in the wrong business, right? You get that, those, those feelings. But I wouldn't act on a decision that largely just on feelings. Uh, there's a lot of financial analysis to back it up. Uh, a lot of forecasting tools that we're doing um, to make those sort of calls. They, they weren't quick. And they were very uncomfortable. Where do you get your fulfillment out of the work that you do? More and more, it's um, helping people. Um, I've been in this industry a long time, very long time. Um, what do you do with all the information? What do you do with all these lessons? Uh, when we grew up in this business, we were always alone. We never had anyone other than my parents. No one that was like a mentor. We were the first to be creating these machines were the first to be roasting in Calgary. And up until very recently, the only competitors we really had were in Vancouver or Toronto. They're, they're not just down the road. So you're alone um, and you felt alone and you were trying to make decisions on your own. You didn't have, well, literally you didn't have the internet. <laughs> right? You didn't have Instagram. You didn't have things to, to learn from and communicate to. So you're going through these these hard lessons uh, alone. And when my dad was doing the coffee roasting, what he really enjoyed was bringing the, the, the coffee, the Calgary coffee community together and trying to create a brand that they could, they could use and feel part of a team, feel a connection. And he really enjoyed that aspect of the business of giving back and, and being an ear to listen to. And I'm starting to resonate that. I, I really like that too. Um, little tips here and there, little little coaching opportunities, but giving um, giving information back, I'm enjoying. Uh, I love working with our team when when there's a, a time and our ability to to guide them a, a certain way. I get a kick out of that. Um, but at home, really, right? I've got a young family there, and. Uh, that, that brings me energy, right? Watching them develop and grow and I guess same sort of thing, right? Little tips and coaching and guiding and uh, I, I get a lot out of that, yeah. Is it, imp you mentioned that, you know, when, when, you were, when you were coming up, there wasn't that community and now there might be. Um, how, do, how do you go about fostering that, that community and, and maybe, maybe even it be informal kind of coaching scenarios or that sort of thing? How do you go about deciding who's, who's part of that community and, and your involvement with it? Yeah, I'm not really good at developing that, to be honest with you. I'm a, I'm a pretty shy guy. Um, really keep to myself quite a lot. Um, I try to be approachable, I hope. And I hope people know, especially people that we're working with, our, our wholesale partners, that we are available. And as soon as someone kind of reaches out, I'll, I'll grab that as an opportunity to, to start blabbering away, <laughs> to, to giving where, where I might see a little, a little tip that makes a big difference to them, uh, a lesson or a document that right, changes the way that they're doing something. And it means so much to them. You solved so many problems for them. Um, but I'm not actively out. It's not like I'm trying to sell a consultant industry or something like that. Um, I'm listening, watching, choosing those opportunities, uh, I guess, wisely. Yeah. When you're in those scenarios and whether they're formal or not, but you're, you, you know, you're helping somebody through something and you're, you know, you're giving them that document, that feedback, whatever the case may be. Do you feel like that's, um, reciprocated in the sense that you're learning as well? You know, maybe they have they have something that they kind of kick back on. And well, I would think what I'm learning is uh, the art of giving back. That's what I'm learning, right? And uh, it's it is an art. Um, it takes focus, right, to want to give back. Uh, we do that with charities we we give back to as well. 
Uh, and I think as we mature in this industry, my brother and I, and we're, we're, we're at a position in our lives where we can give back. And why can we give back and why are we in that position? Calgary, right? Because of all their support. Uh, so we're very fortunate and we know that, that we're, that we're able to. And to me, that's all I really want. I'm not expecting anything, right? I guess what I would expect is a commitment from them that they're going to continue to work with us, right? It's not under contract. There's, there's nothing like that, but you'd hope, you'd hope that they value the assistance we can give and the help we give and, and it goes both ways, but it, it's, it's nothing I, I necessarily ask for or demand. I would never do that. Uh, I know that you've given a significant amount, or Fratello has individually, I'm sure, as well. Um, how do you determine who that goes to when you are giving back? You know, there's so many incredible causes. And there stuff. is. It's, it's nonstop. There's, there's always causes. And earlier on, we used to do projects in Ethiopia where we were outside of coffee, but we were giving back uh, resources to them. And we changed. We wanted to work local. There's so many things you can do in Calgary. There's so many ways to give back to the Calgary community. Uh, and for us, most of what we're doing then is uh, homeless shelters and, and food banks and giving back to the less fortunate and needy in, in those ways. Uh, and that's where we've been committed to for, I think, 10, 15 years now, is just focusing on, on, on that for, for now. There's enough there uh, to keep us busy. Mm -hmm. When you think about the future, um, what, what, is, what does the future hold for Fratello? Yeah, what does the future hold? All right. At this time, right now, we're not looking to create anything new. We're not looking to develop any new businesses. We're looking to uh, take care of what we have, to, to make the most of what we've already been given. Um, helping our, our team here, right? giving them opportunities to grow. Uh, and even where we're selling coffee, it, it's, we're selling to people that we can interact with. We're not shipping it overseas to some individual, it's people we can work with one-on-one. -on -one. So it's developing, developing this community, right? the Calgary community, and a bit more. It's not overly ambitious and it's not overly exciting, but there's still so much to do here. There's so much opportunity here that why look elsewhere we're already being fulfilled here that i don't have those ambitions to be across the world across canada even in the us i, I just don't i don't have that drive today and maybe in a couple of years that'll change maybe right we've done many things over the years so i I, I wouldn't doubt it but for today we're just we're happy with what we have and where we're at do you think that's a that's a common problem in business these days that people look kind of past their scope too soon? I do. Yeah, and we were in the same. Right, we were the same. Very young entrepreneurs uh, trying to conquer the world. Right, uh, and I think that's natural. I think that's very natural. It's like a teenager. Right, we're going to be out there wild, doing weird, dumb things. <laughs> right, because they're just trying to figure out who they are. Where where do they stand in the world? And I think that's the same with, with entrepreneurs and business people is you never know what's going to stick. So you, so you try a whole bunch of different things to see what is resonating, what do people actually want from them. Uh, and then we'll find a path and, and go in that direction and then do it again and then do it again. So running a business, you're, you're constantly having to shift and change with, with the industry or, or where the market's driving you. Do you think the ability to do so in an effective and relatively quick manner uh, can you know, affect the outcome of, of, of the business? I do, yeah, and it kind of almost brings back to that fail fast. It's, it's making those necessary decisions quickly. Uh, and we've had to pivot many times. Uh, we do all the time. And it might not be as drastic, but it's little pivots and movements, making sure that you're, you're always current, you're always, um, right? delivering what the, where the market is going, uh, trying to be a leader, uh, causes you to always be looking into different directions and, and making small adjustments all the time. If you were able to go back and give yourself um, some advice, you know, all those years back when you started, mm. um, of something that you've learned along the way, 
that might be really valuable to you at the beginning? What might that be? What would I tell myself? I think it would be to be more focused. Um, right? We've had a lot of distractions over the years and some of them, some of them great. Uh, but if we were just focused on the one brand and did that well for 50 years, where could this business be? Now, it wouldn't be the same business because we wouldn't have learned those lessons. We wouldn't have had that knowledge that we do today. So I don't know if that advice would even be the right advice for, for someone who's 19 getting into business. You need to learn those things. You, you need to have some hard lessons uh, to make you right, stronger, to give you that wisdom. Um, other advice I would give would be uh, d developing better process, better systems for, for training, for safety, uh, for maintenance, uh, having those developed very early on, uh, it brings you peace of mind uh, as an entrepreneur and business person. When you, when you know there's a certain level of, uh, of call it tasks that are, are being maintained for you and taken care of for you, you don't have to think about them. You don't have to stress out about them because there's so many details going around that if you can start taking care of some of those that you don't have to think about anymore, you're able to to be more creative in different ways that value the company more. And uh, it took us a, a lot of years to, to develop those processes here to get our facility to a point where it is running like it is today, like a professional organization. You said something in there that was, um, it gives you time to be creative in different ways. What is your way of being creative? Hmm. My way of being creative. Yeah, that is, uh, I've never been asked that before. That is interesting. I do a lot of uh, uh, like research, just following many, many different roasters and, and, and cafes around the world. So it is trying to find uh, the, the next little hot thing, whatever it might be, and, and trying to figure out how to develop it here. Uh, how can we do it on our own? How can we create our own? Um, that would be a way of being creative. Uh, it's different now when we had the cafes, it was easier because it was about developing spaces. It was finding uh, the right locations and, and creating a, a space that, that suited that community. And, and, and every cafe was different, so it was fun. It was an outlet. But now that we don't have that outlet, it's, it's all internally. And until very recently, it was being creative around those right processes and, and, and systems within Fratello to make it run smooth. But now it's about, I think, product development and where could we, uh, where could we go? Who could we be working with? Um, uh, using my network and relationships and kind of right, meeting people up. And, and so there's a lot of creativity around uh, communicating to the right people, I guess, yeah, developing those, those key relationships more. What does success look like to you? Peace of mind. Health. Um, having uh, work-life balance. Family. Uh, spending time with your family. Um, having the freedom to, right, to have a morning where you might be at, at the gym, right? So free time. Uh, free time, health, relationships, that's success, right? If you're uh, running a busy business but are bogged down with stress, sick from stress and not sleeping and you don't have quality relationships at, at home or outside of home, what's the point? What is the point of that? Uh, so free time and peace of mind. I, I would say is, is success. Mm -hmm. That being bogged down by, you know, external factors and not be, not having that time, not having those relationships, et cetera. Was that something that you learned? Yeah, very, very much so. Um, during COVID, uh, when we were forced to close down all our cafes in our bakery, uh, when we closed Corbo Bakehouse, we still kept the bakery going, Corbo Bakery. So that was another business uh, that was being operated. 
Um, but before COVID, we had the three brands. Uh, it was about 140 employees, uh, all very different businesses. Uh, there was only work. It was the only thing on my mind. Uh, all night, couldn't sleep, always stressed out, um, never enough time in the day. And it was normal for both my brother and I. We were just, we were living with 100% adrenaline all the time. And then when COVID happened, we closed the stores and it needed to change. Because of COVID, we were forced to make some hard decisions. And one of them was uh, selling analog coffee to another local uh, Calgary company here and um, giving them the ability to take what we created and scale it. Now, fortunately, we still do the coffee roasting for them and work with them very closely. So it's a great benefit for us to see them grow. But we knew we couldn't keep doing what we were doing. It was too much. I've said, we're not, <laughs> I'll speak for myself. I'm not smart enough to do three different brands and three different companies. I'm not. I don't know how to manage teams well enough. I don't know how to get them to accomplish our goals. I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to learn that skill. I didn't take that at school. I've never been mentored by anyone who has done that. So releasing analog to them, and then a week after that, we closed the bakery, sold off all those assets. It was terrible. It was so awful to go through that experience. But afterwards, for both my brother and I, this freedom, this weight off our back to be able to now decompress, relax, <laughs> connect again, focus on what we have. And this is why we don't have those big ambitions of, of growing and doing something new. It's like, I'm not ready for that. I don't want that at all. And it's because of that, because of those experiences we've been through and that level of stress and anxiety to be freed from that is a blessing that we don't take for granted. Um, so I think it was through that experience that we're able to talk that way and live that way now and know what, what success means, or again, for me, is that peace of mind and uh, ability to, the ability to relax, what a concept. Um, one we've never known our whole life until now. Do you think it took that, that forced slowing down, you know, COVID being that thing in this case? Yes. Um, to get to that point? 100%, I do. Yeah, 100%. During COVID, I had a sev several leases being negotiated for new locations. We're, we were just ramping up. We're just starting to talk about other cities to do analog in. Right? We, we weren't about to slow down at all. So it was 100% forced upon us. Uh, and at the time, we didn't like it. But looking at it now, we, we knew it was forced upon us. And we know it was the best thing that, quite frankly, the best thing that could have happened to us was that. Prior to that, I'm always curious, um, you know, when your baseline is so high, when you're constantly going and you don't know rest, you don't know what you're missing, really, because you haven't seen the other side. Did you think that you were resting, you know, in those, t in those scenarios? Yes, yeah. mm -hmm. of course, absolutely. I'd be resting on my couch working <laughs> or resting in bed researching, right? There was never a downtime. Uh, there was no rest. On holidays, you're on calls, you're on emails, you're, you're constantly, constantly working. Uh, and it was just normal. Normal for so many years that uh, I didn't think it was weird. Uh, again, when you're, you're, you have that much adrenaline going all the time and it's all you know, it's the only thing keeping you going. Uh, as soon as the adrenaline kind of dropped, you get sick and <laughs> be forced to relax in bed sick for four days before you go back to work again. It's, it's no way to live. Um, but no, I, I didn't realize how stressful that life was until it was gone. Yeah, definitely. I think that's such a commonality these days where whether it be entrepreneurs or otherwise are stuck in that space 
um, of you know constant stimulation, constantly work. Maybe it's not even work. Maybe it's something else. But they're constantly doing something. As somebody who's you know come out the other side, if you will, and kind of seen the light at the end of the tunnel, or you know realize that there is this other aspect of life that is important. Um, do you have any uh, insights as to how somebody might find themselves in that position, or how to get get out of that position? How to get out? No, I think that's going to be individual uh, to the person. But getting into it, I, I have to think it's just our, our life with even social media being involved. You're constantly looking at what other people have, what other people are accomplishing, what other people are doing. And if you have drive, then you're right. I, I think it's just going to in you. You can do that. And so you just start creating and moving in that direction. And when does it stop? Uh, it's different for everybody. But I have to think that's what's fueling a lot of people that are stuck in, in, in on that wheel is they're just looking at what, what else there is out there. It's so easy to get sucked into that world. Um, all right, it's, it's dangerous. It's, if, you're, if you don't stop and appreciate what you have and be thankful for what you have, then you're always chasing something to, to make you happy. Uh, but that race never ends. You're just going to be constantly going. What does it mean to you to be uh, continuing the legacy that your, your father started 50 years ago? Well, it means a lot, right? It's uh, because of what my, my both my mom and dad were running the company. My, my mom was doing all the books and finances. My dad was uh, the face of the company in sales and coffee, right? Uh, and we're doing it today. And we are who we are today because of our upbringing, because of watching my parents do business, do business well, uh, fairly, honorably, um, right? That's what made us the entrepreneurs we are, is that upbringing. So to continue on his legacy, running a business the same way does mean a lot. And I know it makes them proud. And I think if my parents are proud of what we're doing and how we're running our business, it says a lot. It means we're doing it the way that, that they would do it, which is a, a family legacy. It is. Mm -hmm. The ultimate measure of success. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. If your mom and dad are proud, then you're doing it right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Where can we send people to follow along uh, you know, the next steps of your journey and, and what you guys are doing? Well, we're on our website. We have an active blog uh, for telecoffee.com. Uh, we're also active on uh, Instagram and Facebook, um, and the X platform, and LinkedIn. Uh, LinkedIn is a good place where we're quite active as well and communicate often. But uh, all those usual social media channels, and uh, we, we post all, often on, on who we're working with in different uh, places where you can consume our coffee and uh, what's making us excited. Awesome. Thank you so much, Russ. I really, really appreciated this conversation. Yeah, it was my pleasure. Thank you so much.